afternoon and welcome to IBA News this Monday, the 1st of August. I'm Elon Aslan Levy, joining you live from Jerusalem. The dispute in the government over the funding of over the future of public broadcasting between Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and members of his coalition has reached a boiling point, sparking fierce arguments from the cabinet room to the Knesset. IBA's political correspondent Kalev Ben David is here to fill us in on all the details. Kalev, thanks, Elon. The gloves were off in a heated discussion at yesterday's cabinet meeting between Prime Minister Netanyahu and members of his government and even his own Likud party who believe he is trying to weaken the new corporation set to replace the Israel Broadcasting Authority next year. Netanyahu asked ministers to back his proposal to delay the start of the corporation to January 1st, 2017, with an option to extend the delay until April 1st. According to reports, Likud culture minister Miri Regev criticized the head of the corporation, Eldad Koblenz, and asked her fellow members what was the point of creating a new broadcasting entity if they do not control it. Likud Public Security Minister Gilad Erdan, who spearheaded the broadcast reforms while serving as communications minister, shot back at Regev that she does not control the content of theaters who receive her ministry's funds. While Social Equality Minister Gila Gamliel accused Regev of fascism, Jewish Home Housing Minister Naftali Bennett then charged the Likud with trying to shut down the broadcasting corporation because he said they had lost control of it. Science Minister Ofer Akunis then claimed that Jewish Home was only supporting the corporation because it had hired several reporters belonging to the National Religious Camp. Justice Minister Ayelet Chaked, also from Jewish Home, lashed back that Likud MKs were acting like crybabies who had no reason to complain since they owned their own newspaper, a clear reference to the Sheldon Adelson-owned Yisrael Hayom. The cabinet finally approved the prime minister's proposal to delay the broadcasting corporation, with Erdan, Shaked, Bennett, and Gamliel abstaining in the vote. The tensions in the cabinet then spilled over into the Knesset, with Likud coalition chairman David Bitton proposing a new bill that would cancel the new corporation and leave the original Israel Broadcasting Authority in place. Opposition Knesset members responded that there is no chance of that happening at this stage. But clearly, the political battle over who controls public broadcasting and its news coverage of our politicians is far from over. Elon? Kalev, Minister Adan is undoubtedly the biggest opponent of any attempt to derail the new broadcasting corporation. Is that because this project is his baby or is there a bigger principled issue at stake? Well, first of all, I think it partially yes, because he was the one who initiated these reforms. But yes, there is a bigger issue at stake. Uh, there are other, as I said, members of the government, even in the Likud, are concerned about the possibility of Prime Minister Netanyahu controlling too many areas of the media. Uh, Gilad Erdan is someone, is someone who sees himself as a possible leader of the Likud party, maybe even a rival to Netanyahu. Uh, in, in the near future. And yes, he is obviously there's some political concern on his part. Uh, speaking of political concerns, the Jewish Home Party really took the gloves off right. when it said that it refused to be the Prime Minister's whipping boy any longer. Uh, what is the reason that Naftali Bennett is locking horns with the Prime Minister over this issue specifically? Well, you know, it's interesting alone because ideologically you would expect maybe Jewish Home Party to be supporting Netanyahu on this issue. Uh, they belong to the nationalist right camp, which often complains of left-wing bias in the media, including at the Public Broadcasting Authority. But in this case, clearly, to some degree, the personal is the political. We know the Prime Minister and Bennett and Ayala Chekhead just don't like each other on a personal level. There might be some competition. Also, why... Saying this coalition crisis is all a matter of personal animosity between no, Bennett and the Prime Minister? No, that's... First of all, that's part of it. But no, not all of it, because, as I said, there is some rivalry, maybe not in the Likud, but here it's rivalry for control of the national camp. Naftali Bennett sees Jewish Home as a possible replacement for Likud as leading the nationalist camp and him as a replacement for Netanyahu. Again, concern over the prime minister's, what they feel, expanding control over the media. Okay, well, the prime minister says that he wants to liberalize the media market in Israel, but his critics accuse him of, of the opposite, of trying to repress free media in Israel. What is the prime minister really aiming at here? You know, the, the people in the prime minister's camp 
are quick to point out that when much of the Israeli media was controlled by Arnon Moses, the chairman of the company that owns Yidiot Achronot and invests several broadcasting uh, entities, and who is the brother-in-law of one of the former main Likud rivals for Na against Netanyahu, Silvan Shalom, was not out of the government, that they weren't complaining about media control and media monopoly then. Uh, the, pro the people in the prime minister's camp say they are trying to liberalize uh, the uh, media section, the way they did the telecommunication sector. It's true. There are some tycoons who have come in, that's Sholden Adelson, Shol uh, Ilovich, that are friendly with Netanyahu. Netanyahu's feeling is why can't, so other people will be free to bring in their tycoons or bring in their investors. Kalev, thank you very much. Pleasure. While the government argued over broadcasting reforms, the opposition Labour Party remained embroiled in an internal dispute no less fierce over when to hold its next leadership election. Despite heckling and much infighting, the primaries were pushed off until next July, extending the leadership tenure of Isaac Herzog by one year. Back to Kalev Ben David. The Labour Party Central Committee gathered in Tel Aviv Sunday to decide when to hold its next leadership vote, and the meeting quickly degenerated into a free-for-all. Chairman Isaac Herzog had angered supporters of his rivals for the party leadership by calling for the primary vote to be delayed until next summer. And when he took to the stage, they began chanting, Bougie, go home, using Herzog's popular nickname. The usually mild-mannered Herzog exploded, shouting out to the crowd they were behaving like La Familia, the extremist soccer thug supporters of the Beitar Jerusalem football team. He also condemned pamphlets distributed at the gathering that compared him to dictatorial leaders Vladimir Putin and Recep Erdogan, and blamed such behavior on the encouragement of his main rivals for the party leadership, Shelly Yakhimovich and Arel Margalit, who demanded the primary be held in December. Yakhimovich called Herzog's performance sad and said he was the one encouraging violence in the party. Margalit dissociated himself from the attacks on Herzog from the convention floor, but said he was a weak leader who needed to be replaced as soon as possible. At the end of the day, Herzog prevailed, as the Central Committee voted to delay the next leadership vote to next summer, giving Herzog a whole year to try and restore the party's trust in his leadership. If such a thing is still possible, this is Kalev Ben David for IBA News. IDF forces overnight arrested nearly a dozen suspects in the West Bank town of Dura, connected to last month's drive-by shooting in which Rabbi Mikhail Mark was murdered. Among the detainees are several relatives of Palestinian terrorist Mohammed al fakir who carried out the deadly attack. al fakir himself was killed last week in an exchange of fire with security forces who tried to arrest him. The IDF said that as part of a mass crackdown on terrorists, its troop conducted widespread operations across the West Bank overnight, during which they tracked down weapons workshops and arms dealers. A total of 27 suspects were arrested in the sweep. In a related development, a potential terror attack was thwarted last night when security forces at a checkpoint in Samaria discovered four pipe bombs inside the vehicle of an Arab-Israeli citizen from the Bedouin town of Rahat. The man was stopped and searched while driving a car with Israeli license plates on the way to Kfal Saba. Sappers arrived to neutralize the bombs and the driver was taken for questioning. Earlier Sunday, another attack was foiled when the Palestinian armed with a knife was shot dead by soldiers after he attempted to stab them at the Hawara checkpoint outside the West Bank city of Nablus. The terrorist emerged from his vehicle and charged towards troops manning the checkpoint, but they noticed him and shot him dead. The Defence Ministry's Tank Administration has completed preliminary development of the first ever armoured personnel carrier on wheels. Called the ATAN, the protective vehicle is considered one of the most advanced in the world. It was designed after drawing lessons from Operation Protective Edge, known in Hebrew as Operation Tsuk Eitan, hence the name. It will include a remote-controlled gun and missile launcher operable without crews leaving the vehicle, will be able to travel at a speed of 90 kilometers an hour, and can carry up to 12 soldiers at a time. The head of the tank administration, B Brigadier General Baruch Matzliach, says the plan is to replace the thousands of old APCs with modern vehicles and to develop a complementary device to give infantry troops maximal protection. During fighting in Shejaia in Gaza two years ago, a Hamas anti-tank missile hit an old army APC, killing seven IDF soldiers. 
The prison's parole board is set to announce on Thursday its decision on whether to grant convicted rapist and former president Moshe Katsav early release. The decision was originally supposed to be published yesterday but was delayed due to ongoing work sanctions by court employees. Katsav, who has so far served over two-thirds of his seven-year jail sentence for rape and other sexual offenses, submitted a request for early release. In April, the parole board rejected the request on grounds that the former president never expressed remorse for his crimes. Katsav's defense team appealed the decision, citing a new expert's evaluation submitted by the Prisoner Rehabilitation Authority that stated that Katsav can undergo a rehabilitation program outside of jail. The prison's parole board convened several times over the past two weeks, including yesterday, having previously rejected a request for early release, noting, as we mentioned, that Katsav had denied his crimes and still refused to express regret. On a similar subject, Brigadier General Ofek Bukhris has retired from the IDF to stand trial as a civilian on multiple counts of rape and other sexual offences against female subordinates. Bukhris described his decision as an attempt to set an example and take moral responsibility before engaging in the fight of his life for his reputation and innocence. He thanked Chief of Staff Gadi Eisenkot for authorizing his request for early retirement and stated that he wished to return to service after he clears his name. The attorney of one of the complainants responded that Bukhris had done the right thing by stepping down. Member of Knesset Michael Oren and former MK Dov Lipman are joining forces to establish a new Knesset caucus to support English-speaking immigrants in Israel, which will have its inaugural hearing at the Knesset Immigration and Absorption Committee tomorrow. Well, Rabbi Lipman joins me now in the studio. Rabbi Lipman, welcome. Great to be here. What is the purpose of this caucus? Anglo immigrants appear to be a very successful community on the, on the face of it. And that's what everyone in government thinks, that's what everyone in the Knesset thinks, and therefore there's no effort made to deal with some real, real problems facing this community. During the 19th Knesset, I tried, somewhat single-handedly, to deal with some of these issues. Issues such as driver's license uh, renewal, issues such as double taxation, paying social security in Israel, and in, in America, uh, here. Uh, taxation issues, professional licenses, people who have years of experience and great These sound degrees. like problems that are common to all immigrants. Why are these problems that are specific to Anglo immigrants rather than, say, French, Olin? So there actually happen to be lobbies or caucuses for other groups. That's first of all, where they've the country has recognized uh, they need help and they're trying to help their populations. And we said, first of all, we join all of those efforts. We're in favor of helping all immigrants that come. But we sat together and we went through the list and many of the issues that we were talking about were very specific to immigrants from English speaking countries. So we said, it's time to start a caucus. It's time to start a joint effort, opposition and coalition together to try to really uh, confront them and really sit with a work plan to try to make changes okay, in these well, areas. If we're talking about very specific reforms, forms on technical and, and administrative matters, then why is a Knesset caucus the correct way to go about it rather than approaching legislators issue by issue and, and to deal with this more strategically? So for example, tomorrow morning in the Knesset we're going to have an issue dealing with uh, national service for women that are immigrants from all populations. And if I walked around and talked about this issue, I'd get somewhere possibly. There's going to be over 70 people in a very small committee room tomorrow, and members of Knesset are going to walk in and they're going to say, wow, this is a bigger issue than I thought if this many people are taking the time on Tuesday morning to come. It's a show of force, not in a negative way, but in the most positive sense. That this is an issue which has to be dealt with. That's number one. Number two, the moment you form an official caucus, uh, members of Knesset want to join in. They want to be involved. They want to show that they're helping this population as well. And that creates both a, a, a bipartisan effort where we say... Multipartisan multi in this country. In this case, right. Let's find a way uh, to make changes. And again, we're not coming uh, just to throw issues into the air. We're coming to every single committee hearing with a concrete act of legislation or act of government that okay. can address these issues. Uh, immigration from Anglo countries is at a trickle, possibly even negative in net terms. Does that say more about Israel or the home countries that these people don't want to leave? So I certainly wouldn't put it on Israel. I feel that uh, it's actually difficult for me sometimes when I travel, the lack of discussion about Aliyah. You know, here after 2,000 years, we have our country. It's here. You can come. Or even... Life is good in America. Life is good. But even how about educating your children towards Aliyah? And this is an approach which I've been taking lately to talk about this issue. How have we abandoned this uh, completely? But I do feel that if we go out of our way to remove some of the obstacles, 
levels, make things even better for people, especially younger uh, olim, fresh out of college, maybe before their second degree, make things even easier, make it the in thing to do, so to speak, to come to Israel, do some kind of service, and possibly stay, that could trigger greater numbers. But my, my true interest is helping those that are here. One of the many issues worrying Anglos in Israel, and particularly viewers of this show, is the concern that English news might be taken off the air in the context of the new broadcasting corporation. Will your caucus seek to protect the status of English language broadcasting in legislation? Absolutely. Now, we tried uh, in the previous Knesset to put it into the legislation itself. And it's and not the, there. I'm Haric, right. Russian, no English. Right. So the government uh, actually answered me when I turned to them. They said, we're not putting anything in there about programming. But then, as you mentioned, all of a sudden you find that things are there. We are going to make a major effort to make sure that it continues. The idea of English language in general, in government ministries, in all the bureaucratic places in the country, it has to be, it's not on the radar screen right now. It's our responsibility to put it on the radar screen. And English news should certainly be first and foremost among them. Well, on behalf of all our viewers, best of luck, Rabbi Lippman. Thank, Thank you very you much so for coming. Much. Thank you. Four years after President Obama mocked Republican candidate Mitt Romney for suggesting Russia represented America's greatest geopolitical threat, this year's presidential election is being overshadowed by fears of Russian meddling and Donald Trump's controversial policies towards Russia. The Clinton campaign has accused the Kremlin of being behind the leak of the Democratic National Committee emails in a bid to sway the election in favor of Mr. Trump. The White House is refraining from publicly accusing Putin, despite an assessment by intelligence agencies that Moscow was almost certainly responsible. Meanwhile, Trump has aroused outrage by calling on Russia to hack into Hillary Clinton's emails and publicize them. He also stirred controversy by saying yesterday that Russian President Vladimir Putin wouldn't make a military move into Ukraine, even though he has done precisely that, invading the Crimean Peninsula. Indeed, Trump also proposed recognizing Russia's claim over Crimea, suggesting that its residents preferred being part of Russia than Ukraine. The American Jewish community appears to be split over November's upcoming presidential election. Alongside grave concern about Donald Trump, many feel uneasy about President Obama's relationship with Israel and fear that Hillary Clinton would continue his path. Israel Television's Natan Gutman asked Sarah Bard, the Jewish outreach director of the Clinton campaign, how she thinks the race will turn out. You know, just as John Podesta said, we're not here to uh, run President Obama's third term. Her record stands on its own. Um, and over the coming uh, weeks and months, um, you know, we'll be traveling across the country, connecting with the Jewish community. And what we're really hearing is overwhelming support, not only from Democrats, but as well as independents and Republicans who are coming out in support of Hillary Clinton. Because they like her domestic agenda or her foreign policy? I would say both, that she's strong here at home and that she's strong here abroad. You know, Jewish Republicans have been saying that they're seeing this gradual shift in the, in the Jewish vote. They see it climbing slowly, slowly from the teens to around 30 percent. What's your bet? Uh, how will Jewish uh, Americans vote uh, this year around? Well, I know that that's an argument that they try to make, um, but I certainly don't think that this election cycle is going to prove them uh, correct in any way. Um, all you have to do is just look at the lack of Jewish support they had at their convention last, last week and look at key statements by leading figures, independents and Republican Jewish leaders um, concerned about Donald Trump and supporting Hillary. But can you put a number on it? 20 percent, 30 percent? How much will the Republicans get of the, of the Jewish vote? I think that they're actually going to be losing some of the Jewish vote that they think that they have. Now, while Hillary Clinton seems to have a long history with the, in the Jewish community, there are also other voices in the Democratic Party. There are polls that show that grassroots Democrats uh, um, tend to be more critical of Israel, more supportive of the Palestinian cause. Uh, we saw the debate over the platform, attempts by the Sanders uh, campaign to change the platform language on Israel. Um, how do you view this? Is, this? is there anything that you can say that would be reassuring to the old-type pro-Israel crowd? Well, uh, you know, look, I think uh, the appointment by Colonel West and James Ogby on the platform committee, um, I know that their views don't represent where I think uh, the majority of Democrats fall. And all you have to do is look at the final vote on the platform and look at the final language. But still, this, this is a sentiment that exists within the party. I don't think that it's a large segment of the party. I think it's a, I think it's a small part, and I think it was Cornell West actually just came out uh, not too long ago and endorsed uh, Jill Stein. Uh, so he's not even endorsing a Democratic candidate this cycle. 
the last election cycle, there was talk, especially in democratic circles, that Israel is intervening somehow in the elections, that the Israeli prime minister or government were endorsing uh, uh, Mitt Romney for president. Do you feel any sense of Israeli involvement this time around? Well, I can tell you this. I was in Tel Aviv um, about two months ago uh, speaking to supporters, and I was actually surprised that half of the room, well, maybe not surprised, but half of the room were actually Republicans. Um, we have a very high level of Republican uh, American in Israel, Jewish support. Um, uh, so I, I, I think that I, I, I don't necessarily think that that would be happening. Um, I think that we have strong support from, American, um, from Americans living in Israel and Israelis. Thank you so much. Well, before we let you go, you yourself have big news. You'll be moving to Israel? That's true, yes. Moving to Israel after the campaign. So um, I'll be looking for any uh, good tips that you can pass along. We're very excited and look forward to uh, catching up on sleep, hopefully. I'm sure we have a lot of tips uh, to give you as we approach November. Thanks so much for joining Thank us. Thank you so much. In finance, shares are mixed on the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange, and the shekel is starting the week off mixed in foreign currency trading. And in weather, temperatures will remain stable tomorrow, that is to say, unseasonably hot and humid along the coast. And that's all for today. Join us again tomorrow for all the latest. From me and the entire IBA team, it's a good evening, live from Jerusalem.